Hello there, fellow adventurers! Welcome back to the second part of this special 50th episode, which is all about Phantasmagoria 2. Alright, that joke's starting to get old. In this part, we're looking at some of the other versions of King's Quest 1, besides the DOS re-release in 1986. Let's start with everyone's favourite, King's Quest for the Sega Master System. Eh? Hey? That's right, this is one of the few games in the series to be ported to a console, another being King's Quest V for NES. The box art is quite puzzling at first. I mean, since when does Sir Graham have a sword? The characters around him are actually from the story of how the three great treasures of Daventry were lost. We've got the sorcerer who took the magic mirror, and the dwarf who tricked the king and queen into giving him the magic shield. He's holding a root that he claims would cure the queen's illness, but sadly, that was a load of old bollocks. Then there's this princess witch hybrid monster with two heads that represents the witch who disguised herself as Princess Dahlia, then stole the key to the treasury and flew off with the magic chest. Apparently, this isn't just an adventure game, it's a text adventure action game. Hmm, maybe that's the reason for the sword. Is Graham going to hack and slash his way around the kingdom? Let's find out, shall we? Playing and recording this game was an adventure in itself. As it says on the back, this mega cartridge is for use with the Sega system only, so it didn't work in my CD drive. After obtaining the power of the Sega Master System, I also needed to figure out how to connect it to my PC to record gameplay. Not being an expert in consoles like Metal Jesus for example, this was not entirely straightforward. My trusty Elgato video capture only displayed the game in black and white, so after experimenting with a few other capture cards, I finally settled on one which isn't perfect, but at least it's in colour. One thing that's unique about this version is that whenever you die, you have to enter a code to continue. No worries, we should be back where we were in no time after entering the code. For a game where death could be lurking around every corner, this 31 digit code is pretty much a deal breaker for all but the most persistent adventurers. Despite this however, I stayed true to the quest and wrote out all the codes, then framed them and put them on my wall to always remind me of this unforgettable experience. So now that we're finally playing, how does this compare with the previous versions? Well firstly, Graham looks more like a court jester with a limp. I'm going to call him Sega Master Graham from now on. The interface is made up of action verbs that replaces the original text parser and menu system. For example, we can jump and duck. Bowing to the king looks exactly the same as ducking. We soon find out that things are not quite right in this topsy-turvy kingdom. Rocks defy gravity by rolling uphill, and even falling a short distance will kill you. Good thing we have those handy save codes, eh? The enemies aren't their usual selves either. The so-called Wicked Wizard looks like he's eaten one too many bananas, and the Thieving Dwarf looks like Cartman from South Park. You will respect my authority! Then there's the old witch who doesn't so much fly around on her broomstick, but hovers just above the ground and keeps getting stuck in the shrubbery. At least the goat is friendly, even though we have the option to kill it. As pointed out by pushing up roses, the goat can be resurrected by showing it the carrot. Though sadly this is only temporary and if you leave the screen and come back, the goat is dead again. The carrot trick doesn't work forever, so I had no choice but to leave the goat lying there and confront the troll myself. When I got there, however, the goat suddenly came out of nowhere and knocked the troll off the bridge. What in the name of all things Daventry just happened? Let's go back and see if the goat is still where we left it. There's some really weird stuff that can happen in this game. The strangest thing I found involves the mushroom on the other side of the raging river. You know, the one that's always taunting us. Ha ha ha, you can't reach me. Just try it, sucker. Can't touch this. 
If we enter this screen from the south, we immediately die, and somehow float on top of the water. Sega Master Greya must have some supernatural powers besides resurrecting goats. The trick is to go as far as possible into the top right hand corner of the screen. Then you can magically appear on the other side of the river and grab that pesky mushroom. Going back the way we came, we now have the power to become Sega Mini Graham and enter the land of the leprechauns from the other side. The leprechauns, however, don't like someone smaller than them intruding in their private sanctum. Okay, let's get back to our quest for the treasures. Here we are in the well leading to the dragon's lair. I wonder how long we can hold our breath. I guess forever. Plenty of time to dance upside down on the surface of the water. Time to face the dragon which I'm expecting to be a huge fearsome beast. Oh, it's a baby dragon, it just wants to play. Oh, I forgot a baby dragon's favorite game is turning people to ash. One thing about the interface I find really confusing is that inventory items are listed together with objects on the screen. For example, in the witch's house, the carrot is in our inventory, but the cheese is in the cupboard. How do we even know the cheese is there? I guess we can add x-ray vision to our list of abilities as well as the power of invisibility, as we can walk right in front of the witch without her seeing us and push her into the oven. After getting the magic beans from our good old gnome friend, Ifen Kova Grogoprum, we plant them and the giant beanstalk shoots out of the ground so hard that it smashes through the text box. Compared to the beanstalk in previous versions, this one is super easy, barely an inconvenience. Just climb straight up until you reach the top. Whoops, too far. Adios, muchachos. The land of the clouds isn't as treacherous this time either, as we can actually walk in the clouds. Remember that movie with Keanu Reeves? Crushing grapes has never been so sexy. We no longer need to ride the condor to reach the land of the leprechauns, as we can just sneak past the river. But if you already ate the mushroom, you're totally buggered, and we'll be trapped there forever. At least we can entertain ourselves by playing the fiddle. Once all the leprechauns have danced themselves away, we're left alone in the throne room with the king. It's just him and us for all eternity. What a shame we missed the exciting conclusion of Sega Master Graham's quest. And so we move on to the official remake by Sierra in 1990, which uses what's called the SCI engine just like King's Quest IV. First off, I honestly have never been a great fan of this graphical style, and it doesn't quite capture the magic and simplicity of the original for me. The castle, for example, doesn't feel as inviting. Like instead of opening the door ourselves, the guards have to raise the portcullis. The moat is no longer filled with alligators, but sea serpents that will not only eat you, but also steal your hat. Hey, where'd my hat go? That bloody sea serpent must have stolen it. But then, wouldn't I be... dead? After each death, we get an amusing message that would later become a staple of the series. The rules of death have changed since the dark days of the Master System, and falling from the tree no longer kills us. Let's get straight down to our quest and go visit the dragon.
Ah, now that's more like it. This dragon is on fire. Literally. Once again, we can choose to either kill the dragon or extinguish its fire, which fills the cavern with smoke as the dragon slinks off. I admit this part is something of an improvement over the original. The enemies now have their own theme tune. This time when the witch catches you, she turns you into a gingerbread man. Or is that a graham cracker? The woodcutter and his wife no longer have holes in their floor that lead to the depths of hell. We can actually give him the magic mirror which he accepts but goes on to say that he'd rather have some food. Does he even realize what that mirror does? It foretells the future. Well, I guess foretelling the future doesn't really do you much good when you're starving. If we resist our bloodthirsty desire to murder innocent goats, it will once again take on the troll. Looks like the troll jumped off the bridge himself. The gnome now has a spinning wheel for spinning straw into gold, a hint to the story of Rumpelstiltskin, and his real name is now simply Rumpelstiltskin backwards. So instead of Ifenkova Grogoprum, it's Nixtlet Seltmer. Uh, I'm not really sure which one sounds better. The beanstalk is back, bigger and badder than ever. I always found the Land of the Clouds to be a strange and mysterious place, but here it just looks like a dreary, haunted wood. Not even our fiddling can liven things up. The stairs are more twisty and turny than before, but I don't think a wooden walkway is quite as realistic as when they were carved out of the rock. Seeing as the river shortcut doesn't work this time, let's take another ride on Kindly Condor Airlines. Welcome back to Kindly Condor Airlines. Please fasten your seatbelt, it's going to be a bumpy landing. How many times do we fall flat on our face in this game? Up until now, I've totally ignored the giant rat guarding the door to the leprechauns, but now is the time to face the rodent. Ah, oh, rats, he turned us into Swiss cheese. At least the leprechauns don't leave their king behind this time, and he dances away after them. With the great treasures once again back in our possession, it's off to the castle to watch the king die and assume his throne. This time there are plenty of witnesses so no one can accuse us of murdering the king. He just happens to die at the exact time we came back. I've assembled the finest voice actors in all of Daventry to bring this scene to life. The king is dead. Long live the king. Long live the king. Long live the king. Long live the king! Long live the king! Long live the king! Long live the king! Hail to the king, baby! Long live the king! Long live the king! Finally, we come to the VGA fan remake in 2001. AGD Interactive also remade King's Quest 2 and 3 in the same style. This version has both voice acting and character portraits. Greetings, Sir Graham. The King is expecting you. Allow me to escort you to His Majesty's throne room. Thank you, Sir Knight. Not quite sure about King Graham's portrait here. He looks more like an evil warlock in disguise. Maybe he's really Mordak from King's Quest V. I am an old man, Sir Graham. Perhaps too old to carry the weight of this crown. Yeah, the King really does look old like he's about to collapse at any minute. Oh, not yet. Wait until we found the treasures first. On the title screen, we're given the option of choosing to play with or without dead ends, like when we ate those magic beans. Let's give ourselves a break from dead ends, shall we? F*** that shit. The interface has been updated to reflect the one used in King's Quest V and VI, with icons for the different actions like look, talk, and use. 
Let's try them out on ourselves. It's you, Sir Graham, the finest knight in all of Daventry. Talking to yourself is a sure sign that the hot Daventry sun is taking its toll on you. You check to make sure that the feather is still securely stuck in your cap. Sir Graham doesn't have the same ability to hold his breath underwater like Sega Master Graham. Well, well, well. What are you gonna do now? Oh, I get it. It's funny because we drowned in the well water. I was so distracted by that chest at the bottom of the well, but turns out it's not the chest we're looking for. These aren't the droids you're looking for. The dragon looks just as big and ferocious as the one in the Sierra remake. I like to put the eye icon just here to give it some more personality. By venturing too close to the dragon's flame, you made an ash out of yourself. Oh, I get it. The dragon turned us to ash and it sounds like, uh... Ass! Well, let's continue, shall we? Apart from the dagger and the water, there are other, more indirect ways to deal with the dragon. One is to confront it when you have the fairy godmother's protective spell. Wait, what fairy godmother? Well, she turns up randomly on a certain screen, and casts a spell on us that protects us from enemies, that would only last for a limited time. Her voice and portrait aren't exactly how I imagined her. Gentle Sir Graham, I am your fairy godmother. The other way of avoiding the dragon is to wear the Ring of Invisibility given to us by the elf. Ring? Elf? What am I talking about? Oh, sorry, I also forgot to mention there's an elf you can meet, who gives you a ring if you're friendly and talk to him. I've had me eye on you, Sir Graham. Methinks you might enjoy this little trinket. Sounds just like the leprechaun from the movie. Ah, is that a piece of gold I see? My favorite thing to do when invisible is to talk to the castle guards. What did you say, Frank? I beg your pardon? I thought I heard you say something about my sister. I appreciate all the easter eggs like this, and in jokes like Ledger Suit Larry walking out of the mountain door, and a reference to Cedric the Owl from King's Quest V. I wish I had an owl to keep me company. Be careful what you wish for. Graham, watch out! A poison a snake! Ducking actually comes in useful in this version to avoid the witch. Watch out for the sorcerer and dwarf combo move though, when you first get frozen and then stolen from. The sneaky little dwarf caught you by surprise. Did he steal anything from you? The beanstalk isn't a death trap anymore as you can't fall off no matter what you do. If you try and play the fiddle while climbing, you can get Graham to walk up the beanstalk instead of climb. Here, the land of the clouds is more colorful and the giant kills you by jumping on you and squashing you flat. The giant did a smashing job of defeating you. Oh, it's funny because the giant smashed us, so we did a smashing job. Moving on. The giant rat sounds like he's in the rodent mafia. Hey friend, you wanna go through this door? Make me an offer. And I'll promise I'll let you breeze right through. Of course, giving him cheese is an offer he can't refuse. Cheese, eh? Well, yeah, now that you mention it, I guess I am kinda hungry. A curious detail in both this and the SCI version is that the leprechauns are partial to dandelion wine, which they brew from the local lake water. That must be why they enjoy partying so much. And once again, we return with the treasures, the king is dead, long live the king. Long live the king. So that's it for this 50th episode. What order do I put these versions in? Well, my least favorite is actually the official remake, followed by the fan remake. Mmm, there's nothing like a crisp, fresh carrot. I'm putting the Sega Master System version at number two, just because it's so weird and dark. 
And I need to justify all that pain and suffering I put myself through with those save codes. Number one is and always will be the 1986 DOS version. For me, nothing surpasses this most pure and holy of adventure games, and no remake really comes close. Ah yes, it's like Star Trek, the next generation. In many ways it's superior, but will never be as recognized as the original. Cheers everyone for watching this 50th episode. Let me know what versions of King's Quest 1 are your favorites in the comments below, and hope to see you on the next adventure. Cheerio! Can't touch this.